So as Babin um, said, I'm a consultant europathologist um, in Newcastle um, in the northeast of England. I'm very lucky to work in that department. Um, I've got very supportive clinical colleagues. And if there's one piece of advice I could give to you all in your careers going forward, do, never, do not underestimate the power of good relationships and good communication between clinicians, radiologists, pathologists and everyone. It really does make a very big difference to to both you and ultimately your patients. So if there's one thing you remember me saying, just remember that thing. Okay, so I've been tasked with talking about the pathology of prostate cancer. Um, I'm going to attempt to give you a bit of a broad um, overview and with a bit of emphasis on what I think are the most clinically important points. So in the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I thought a, a very quick reminder of the pertinent epidemiological and etiological logical factors um, just to provoke a little bit of thinking. I'll do a quick run through the methods of tissue diagnosis, uh, then a few words about histopathology, uh, touching on some important histological factors and some of the important histological variants which you should probably be aware of. What I will concentrate mainly on is what exactly Gleason grading is, what it means and how it's evolving. And then I'll end on a few words about pathological prognostic and predictive predictive factors and a little bit on staging. Um, I hope that what I'm saying is probably going to be echoed throughout the day with the other speakers, so they should consolidate anything that I don't cover in a lot of detail. So the main reason for going over the epidemiology is just to remind us all that prostate cancer is extremely common and of course that means that it has a large um, effect on health systems globally. Uh, the incidence and mortality rates are very variable across the globe. Um, and this is probably linked to the fact that um, a lot of countries have adopted PSA serum screening and um, that we have a lot of earlier detection um, and improved treatments. Um, there's also variation in documented risk factors, which include things such as obesity and high dietary fat and decreased physical activity, which is obviously very variable across the globe. And of course, there is a very strong relationship with advancing age, uh, not least because we still do find a lot of incidental um, prostate carcinoma, carcinoma, both at autopsy and in sister prostatectomies done for other reasons in, in elderly gentlemen. And of course, there's also proven genetic susceptibility as well, um, which I won't go on anymore to because that could probably fill a whole week's worth of um, seminars for you. So moving on to some more practical uh, pathology points. Obviously, pathology assessment requires some tissue. Um, the patient pathway to their diagnosis and therefore their treatment can involve one or more of these methods of tissue diagnosis. So of course, the most common is the needle core biopsy. Um, and they're undertaken usually in gentlemen where there's either a clinical or a radiological suspicion of malignancy. Um, one of my colleagues is probably going to very eloquently talk about the different types of needle core biopsies later on, um, so I won't um, dwell on that for, for any longer. Um, I've just added transurethral resection biopsies there as well, um, just to mention that although they're not a primary diagnostic procedure, they do undergo pathological sampling uh, due to the known incidence of clinically inapparent disease, especially in older patients. And then of course, radical prostatectomies, which provide a final diagnosis grade and stage and stratify the patient prognosis and guide any subsequent uh, treatment and follow up. Okay, again, I don't want to dwell too much on the ins and outs of actual um, histopathology because uh, I'm the pathologist, I don't want to teach you to do that, otherwise I'll be out of a job. Um, but I just did want to mention um, that when we get um, needle core biopsies from prostates, we examine them all, um, we examine all the tissue that's submitted and we also examine it at several different um, levels of tissue. And that's because of the nature of um, prostate sampling. Although there obviously is a move to more targeted sampling, which I'm sure will be talked about later by, by my radiology and clinical colleagues, the, the sampling of prostates is still that. It is sampling. We're not targeting a definite lesion that we can definitely see. 
So therefore the tissue in the cores may well have missed or may well have only caught the edge of, of any tumor that is there. So that's um, why we often report things like ASAP, so atypical small asthma proliferations or high grade pin. And obviously there are things to do with that that change the way that you treat the patient. Again, um, similarly with radical prostatectomies, um, the prostate cancer is often, even when we slice a prostate, we still can't see it. Um, it's not grossly recognizable. Therefore, we need to look at all of the tissue. We embed all the tissue from radical prostates. So it's, it's not a, a small amount of workload. We look at a lot of prostates. Um, it's, uh, yes, takes up a lot of my time, but I, of course, love it. Um, I just wanted to share this quote that I actually read quite recently. Um, I'll let you read it yourself. Um, it's from the World Health Organization classification of tumors. And I think it, it very nicely explains quite a fundamental concept of histopathology. Um, and that, it, it, that's to say it's very much an opinion, albeit an educated one. Um, and I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that although we are classed as a laboratory specialty, it's perhaps better to think of us more like your radiology colleagues um, other than, than your blood science colleagues, because what we're giving you is an opinion um, as opposed to um, an, an absolute answer, um, just something to bear in mind. Obviously, we use that morphological expertise along with things such as immunohistochemistry and consensus opinions between all of us to reach what we hope is a diagnostic accurate conclusion for you and the patient. So this is what I really wanted to concentrate on, um, Gleason grading. Um, so Gleason prostate cancer grading system is used worldwide. It was first developed in the 1960s by Dr. Donald Gleason, and it differs to grading in other types of cancers, um, mainly because it's one, it's based solely on the architectural pattern of the tumor that we see down the microscope. And secondly, and, and probably most different to other, other cancer sites, is that we express it in quite an interesting way. So we express the degree of differentiation of prostate cancer as a sum score of the two most common morphological patterns that we're seeing down, down the microscope. Uh, that being said, it's still essentially just giving you a quantification to the degree of glandular differentiation in the tumour. Um, with one being the most differentiated and five being the least um, differentiated. Um, I should point out at this point that one and the groups one and two from Gleason's original work are pretty much obsolete in, di in, in um, modern diagnostic terms. I wasn't going to dwell too much on talking about tertiary grades because it's a little bit confusing for us. Um, and I think the simplest thing is to just, just think about the the Gleason grading is the two most common grade patterns present. Okay, so we still use the uh, same basic histology patterns that Dr. Gleason described back in the 1960s um, to assign our morphological grades. However, the International Society of Urological Pathologists has modernized and revised this a few times. Um, most recently in 2005, there was a change of some of the um, groups from three up to four. So some of your gentlemen that used to be a three plus three may become a three plus four. Um, and then perhaps more importantly, in 2014, there was the introduction of the prognostic grade groups. Um, and, and the, this is another important point. Um, the grade groups were introduced for a variety of reasons. Um, the main reasons were for clinicians, and that was to simplify the risk stratification and the categorization groups into five rather than the traditional 12 different groups that the, the sum scores would produce. Um, and then perhaps more importantly than that, what it does is it separates out the Gleason seven groups into three plus four and four plus three, which could potentially be cancers that, although they are both scored seven, might behave incredibly differently. And then also, perhaps even more importantly for that, um, the grade groups were also designed for the patients themselves. Um, 
as a, a communication tool. If you're telling somebody that they've got Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6 cancer, then they think that there there's five more groups that are better off than they are, whereas actually we know obviously they've got a lower risk and probably very indolent cancer. So actually calling them grade group 1 sounds appropriately more low grade. So just to reiterate that point with some helpful traffic light uh, systems. We've got the old system there on the left, giving your Gleason some scores, um, and then your new grade groups on the right there. Um, so obviously, um, very important and a lot more simple. Um, this is just going to lead me on to talking a little bit more specifically about pattern four, which is the most important pattern because it's kind of like the moderate and the intermediate grade um, which is where um, possible um, ambiguity or um, difficulty in knowing how to deal with might might arise. Um, there are quite a lot of studies that have looked into the different morphologies of pattern four and they have all they all seem to agree that the presence of a cribriform pattern um, infers a worse prognosis. Um, in fact, if the presence of, of cribriform pattern 4 is associated with increased distant metastases and is an, an independent predictor of um, disease-specific death. So obviously it's probably very useful to have that mentioned in pathology reports. And also, even though we've managed to separate out those two different Gleason 7 groups into grade group 2 and grade group 3, especially within the grade group two cohort, so those are the three plus four groups, it was probably very useful for you guys to know exactly how much pattern four is present in there. There's been quite a lot of studies that all agree that if there's less than 10% pattern four, then that patient may well be better stratified into the lower risk group rather than the intermediate risk group, obviously in the absence of any other risk factors uh, like increased PSA or and um, staging on any imaging. I very briefly wanted to touch on two important histological variants. Basically, everything that I've been talking about so far is about microassonant carcinoma, which is by far the most common. Um, but there are two types that are worth mentioning, and those are introductal adenocarcinoma, which, although rare, um, is a very important um, and significant finding to share with you. You usually don't see it on your own. It's usually combined with microassinocarcinoma. Um, all of the experts don't agree exactly it's on its etiology. Um, the preferred theory is that what it actually represents is high-grade microassinocarcinoma that's managed to retrograde, spread, and grow back along native ducts. Therefore, it looks like it's an in situ where actually it's invasive that's grown back. And then there's a second theory that it's actually an in situ precursor to directly to high grade microassinocarcinoma, carcinoma, which is different to the sort of the high grade pin um, in situ theory. It is associated with adverse findings at time of radical prostatectomy, um, such as a high concurrent Gleason score in the microassinocarcinoma variant, large volume, high stage, and it is actually an independent predictor of clinical outcome. At the moment, we don't actually give it a Gleason pattern, so it's entirely plausible that you could get a core biopsy that has microassinocarcinoma 3 plus 3 and some introductal. The Gleason score at the bottom of the report will still be 3 plus 3, but you need to take note of the fact that introductal carcinoma is present in there because that is a high-risk feature, and I would argue that that should increase the patient's the patient should be put either into the intermediate or even the high risk group. And then quickly, just uh, ductal adenocarcinoma, which again is uh, it's a, a subtype of prostate cancer, which has a distinct morphology uh, when we look down the microscope. We very rarely see it on its own. It's usually in combination with some usual microassinocarcinoma. But again, it's more aggressive than your normal tumour. Um, for the reasons which are outlined on the slide and that you can read for yourself. For whatever reason, we do give this a Gleason score, but it gets a Gleason score of four. So it is reflected, it will be reflected in the final Gleason score if this is present. That you need to be thinking about either intermediate or high risk stratification if your patient has this. <laughs> 
So I just want to finish off with some prognostic and the pathological prognostic and predictive factors. Um, so factors based on callbacks, biopsies, or any incidentally can cancer found in your TURP specimens will predict any histological findings in any subsequent radical prostatectomy specimens. Therefore, it allows for risk stratification and treatment and follow-up planning. By far the most important of these, and this is why it's included in your risk stratifications, it's the Gleason score. Um, and that's used to predict post-operative stage, tumour progression, and prostate cancer-specific survival. Therefore, it plays a pivotal role in the treatment decision. Uh, the amount of cancer in needle core biopsy will correlate with the pathological stage and patient outcome. And that's why we will report the proportion of tissue involved. There's a lot of variation in how this is done, both throughout the United Kingdom, throughout Europe and throughout the world. Um, some people will give a linear extent, some will give a percentage volume of the amount of cancer versus benign tissue. Some will just give you the number of involved cores. The method doesn't really matter as long as sort of you have a locally agreed protocol and you you know what each other is doing. Um, and then other factors um, such as the presence of adipose tissue invasion or seminal vesicle invasion, which you can sometimes diagnose on core biopsies and the presence of perineural invasion are also prognostic of prognostic significance. Um, for completement, um, sorry, completeness, here's a list of the pathological factors which are of significance when we assess radical prostatectomies. Again, good old Gleason grade is the most useful prognosticator, followed by pathological stage. It's well documented that uh, spread beyond the boundary of the gland is associated with a higher rate of recurrence. Um, there's debate about whether quantifying the amount of extra prostatic spread is of enough significance to predict rate of recurrence, but we will report it. Then surgical margin status, which I won't talk about too much because I don't want to upset anyone. Um, it is a predictor of biochemical recurrence following radical prostatectomy. And again, reporting the extent of a positive surgical margin is linked to outcome, so we will report that as well. Tumor size, again, like the amount of cancer in cause, this is very variably assessed and reported by pathologists, but it is a prognostic significance. So we will try and give you an idea of how, what proportion of the prostate is involved by disease. And finally, perineural and lymphovascular invasion. They have less established evidence, but they're still reported. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else um, throughout the day will talk about the, the staging, but just a, a final slide, if you will, to remind you of the pathological TNM staging in the UK, we use the UICC 8th edition, but obviously there's the AJCC, which may well be used um, elsewhere. Um, but it can basically be summarised as PT1 is clinically inapparent, T2, it's confined to the prostate, T3, it's either just managed to sneak out of the prostate and go into the seminal vesicle, and then T4 is when it's managed to get into adjacent structures. And then a nodal and distant METs are either there or not. It doesn't matter how many of them there are. Okay, so a bit of a whistle stop through, through it. Hopefully I've given you a, a bit of an overview and sort of dwelled on some of the more clinically relevant or important points. Um, so thank you very much for your attention.